Hi, my name is Phil Bagg and I am Computing Inspector Advisor for Hampshire. I um, was a CAS Master Teacher. I was also involved in writing and drafting the National Curriculum for Computing. I teach in three schools, um, Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday. Um, and I want to talk to you about developing resilience and problem solving skills with children. And what I have seen in, in, in lots and lots of schools is that our previous ICT curriculum tended to focus on finished products. So it was always about producing something, a lovely poster or uh, a finished spreadsheet. And you know, there's value in these things. Please, I'm, I'm not, I'm not um, poo-pooing those things. But actually, what we found is that because it was all about the finished product and it was often also about doing something for another curriculum area, what we found is that sometimes, you know, children will be a bit behind in those areas and they didn't quite finish on time. And so teachers would actually help them. And sometimes they would actually do the work for them. Um, and in fact, even, even even last week, I have some, some year three pupils who have just come up from Key Stage 1 at a, a local school. And three of them have come up with a woeful lack of any of any computing skills. And this is because their peers have been allowed to just do things for them, to grab the mouse, the keyboard, the trackpad, whatever they're using, and just do it for them. And these children have learned that actually if they look a bit helpless, if they look like they, 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 they can't do something, that someone will just do it for them. And actually, we're, we're all a little bit lazy in some ways. If we think that somebody will actually do something for us, then we will let them do that. And this is, I think, become quite a trend, really, in, in schools. And what I find is that actually computing is one of those areas you can really liberate people out of that. Because computing talks about debugging and the value of that. So it's emphasising process over finished product. And that it's okay for children to struggle and it's okay to get things wrong. Because, of course, if you know anything about programming, you'll realise that actually nobody writes a program and gets it right first time. In fact, if anything, it's a constant process of trying to work out what you what you got wrong and, and fix that. Okay. So we need to tap into this, really. We need to be able to tell children that it's okay to make mistakes, that mistakes are normal because they are normal in programming. Okay, You will not program without making mistakes. Um, and of course, once you get that through to children, I, I find it probably often takes me about four or five weeks to really persuade the children that I'm teaching that actually I mean it, that it's okay to make mistakes that I will never be cross with them if they, if they make a mistake in computing. I might be cross with them if they're making no effort or they sit there if they expect me to do the work for them, but I'll never be cross with them for making a mistake or trying something that doesn't work. That's, that's totally normal, okay? So as part of this, what we also have to have, as well as actually telling children that it's okay to make mistakes, is actually we need to say that it's actually not our job to fix their code for them, and they need to know that. OK, um, and what we're doing here is we're encouraging independence and we're liberating pupils into a messy problem solving, which is so important. Um, what I also find is that we get a certain level of helplessness from from some children. And what do I mean by helplessness? Well, and I've seen this in, in small groups of children in almost every class I've taught. Um, and not just in the, in the schools I teach in regularly, but also in, in lots and lots of schools when we go and do modelled lessons and all sorts of things. Now, what do I mean by helplessness? Well, helplessness I would define as, well, helplessness, first of all, isn't being stuck. Stuck is normal. In fact, without stuckness, there is no learning, okay? Because in fact, if you if you'll never actually reach that stuck point, well, you can never overcome that and go on that next step. Okay, but st helplessness is stuck, but no attempt to find a solution. So if you find children saying things like, well, I had a child today and, and I, I said, you know, so Mr. Bagger, I'm stuck. Okay, right. So what are you stuck on? Well, I'm stuck on everything. Well, that is a prime example of a child who's being helpless. Okay. So my question normally is, well, you know, well, precisely tell me. What is it? I'll help you if you can actually define and say what bit you're stuck on. Hmm. 
hmm, okay, Mr. Back, I'll, I'll go back and have a... Right, and off he toddled. And, and, and actually, he didn't come back because when he started to actually work through what type of things he was stuck on, he actually started to come up with some solutions to them. Another key indicator of a child who's been helpless is when you ask them to describe the problem and they, they, give, they just give you no answer to that. Or you ask them which parts of a piece of code works or doesn't work or the program works and you get just no answer to that. And all of these are prime examples of helplessness. I often see two types of helplessness in school. I get the very sweet helpless, Ah, oh, Mr. Bad, I can't do this. Please, will you do it for me? Well, no, I am not going to do it for you. Because if I do it for you, I'm taking away all these learning experiences and opportunities for you to actually um, develop some resilience and develop some problem solving. Now, the sweet helplessness I found quite easy, but probably the harder one was the very aggressive helplessness. And this tended to manifest in pupils as, well, well I don't know, what, what is all this computing? What's the point of all of this then? Okay. In fact, I realised it for the first time. I had a girl join one of my classes um, from another school. And she did this to me in the first lesson. And it made me feel really horrible inside because I thought, oh, she doesn't get it, you know. Oh, and she, she doesn't like it either. And I was just about to dive in there and do the work for her. And I said, oh, no, hang on, she's being helpless. She's doing exactly the same thing, you know, the, the, of the sweet helplessness. She's just got a better strategy, really. So... When you see children being helpless, what do you do? And I think it's really important just to have some strategies for this, okay, so that we know how to tackle this. So first of all, we've already hinted at one of them, which is that the process is much more important than the outcome here. Okay, so it's okay to give time to actually struggle and to try different strategies and work something through because it's not about the finished product. Okay, that's important. It's also really important to establish a sort of positive attitude towards problem solving. You know, I always use bug and debugging language. Why? Because actually, this is very impersonal. Now, we know that all bug, gum bugs are human errors caused by humans. But actually, it doesn't sound personal. It doesn't sound like it's my mistake, my fault. It's a bug, and I'm debugging it. In fact, I've had children go back and start talking about debugging their sentences. Now, technically, that's incorrect, because technically, you only really debug code. But do I, do I counter them? Do I stop them doing it? No, because actually, they are developing much more important skills of being resilient problem solvers. And I want that from them in every single area of their curriculum. Okay. So using bug and debugging language is important. That whole thing we just mentioned earlier about that actually everybody when their program has bugs and, and just giving them the freedom to make mistakes is so important. Okay. Now I do challenge children's attitudes as well. Okay. Uh, sorry. I do challenge children's attitudes as well. I will say things like, are you trying to get me to do your work for you? Now I don't zoom up to a child and declare that in front of the whole class uh, very very occasionally you might find a child who needs that but that's rare most of the time that's something i go down and i just whisper something like that quietly to them so they can hear the truth is you don't re you can't really change your behavior until you actually realize what you're doing and that's true for all of us. That's true. We know that from counselling techniques. We know that actually people who, who need to change their lives and move on can't actually do that unless they realise what the problem is. And that's true for children. They can't change unless they realise the, the debilitating things of being helpless and, and not actually trying to solve something is actually doing to them. Another thing that's quite important is actually to move away from language that personifies digital machines. Now, you know, this whole language, oh, the computer hates me. You know, it always works for you, Phil, because computers like you, but actually it doesn't, it never works for me. Now that is absolutely wrong. It's incorrect language. Now we wouldn't get away with saying, oh, two plus two equals five, would we? You know, we'd be drummed out of our primary school teaching in a millisecond. Oh, you know, I'm going to spell chicken. But I don't really care about how to spell chicken because spelling just hates me. 
Well, you know, that's just wrong-headed thinking. And why is it wrong-headed in computing? Well, because computers are deterministic machines, which means that if you put the same input in, you get the same output out. If I walked over to one of you at this moment, and please, I'm, yeah, good job, I'm miles away, and okay, I pushed you, and you'd probably sort of ignore me, shrugging off, thinking, well, what's, what's his problem? If I did that the second time, I would probably get a different reaction out of you. And if I did it the third time, <laughs> you know, I, you'd probably either tell me where to get off or walk away, or I'd have a very different reaction. If I did that to a computer, it would do exactly the same thing each time. Now, why is this important to get this language correct? Well, if you, if, you, if you talk about computers in this ways, what you're encouraging children to believe is that there's something capriciousness or nasty in the computer, which is actually stopping it from being able, stopping you from being able to solve that problem, debug it, fix it. Now, that's not true, okay? Because computers just don't work like that. So it might, although sometimes we like to put that humanizing language on computers, please don't do that. It doesn't help and it doesn't help children. What part of the strategies in this, and we sort of hinted this with other children doing things for other children, is to get everybody on side in whatever classroom you work in. It, it's important for you to have these attitudes and not to solve things for children and to be a hint or solution provider, sorry, hint provider, uh, rather than a solution provider, but it's actually just as important that all the other adults and children in your class get this as well. I ban children touching each other's mouse and keyboards. I get them to talk about and explain and point towards things. And if it's about code or if it's about an actual solution to a problem, I ban them from that. And I say, well, you can give someone a hint. You might tell them what block of code you might be useful or what instruction, but don't give them the order of it away. I often compare this to, well, you know, if someone was stuck on a maths problem in their maths book, would you grab the maths pencil out of their hand and write in the answer in their exercise book? No, you blinking well wouldn't. Because if you did, your teacher would hit the roof, wouldn't they? Or you're in a literacy lesson and somebody can't think of an adjective. Hmm. You say you just grab the pencil off them and you write that in. No, you wouldn't dream of doing that. Okay. But actually, when you allow a pupil to grab the keyboard or the mouse or the trackpad or the, the iPad swipe and just do it for somebody else, then you're doing that and you're encouraging them to be helpless and not solve things for themselves. Finally, this, uh, this is really, really important. I mean, I, I actually adopted two lovely kids about five and a half years ago. And my wife said to me, look, when, when they turn up um, <clears throat> and they won't do what you say, they'll do what you, you do. And I didn't really believe my wife. Um, and I remember I was sitting down for dinner and we had a bit of a, you know, little baby bell cheeses and I just unwrapped the wrapper. I was quite excited and I just made something out of it and that was all cool. And then in my excitement, I just flicked it up in the air. And both of my children made a grab for the knife and the fork to throw those up in the air as well. And at that point, I was like, whoa! <laughs> and at that point, I realized, actually, children don't do what we say, they do what we do. So please, if you model helplessness to your children when you're teaching them, if you use that incorrect language, they will do what you do.